we're going to have in the Word and believing that people are going to be confident enough to confront fear and live the lives that they really want to live. In Jesus' name. Tonight we're going to talk about the secrets of a confident woman. And I want to start out by saying that if we have low confidence or no confidence, then really we're lacking in faith. We may call ourselves faith people, but faith is confidence. Philippians 3.3 says, put no confidence in the flesh. We don't put our confidence in us. This is really not about self-confidence. It's about putting confidence in God. Put no confidence in the flesh, but only in Jesus Christ. And if we have our confidence, if each one of us has our confidence in Christ, then we can all really have the same amount of confidence. Because He's going to give every one of us what we need to do what He's called us to do. Now I want you to get that. God will give every one of us what we need to do what He's called us to do. He is not going to call any one of us to do something and not give us the faith, the grace, the confidence to do it. And I'm not just talking about ministry gifts, preaching, leading worship, that kind of thing. Even if you're in a, a difficult marriage, but you believe it's where God wants you and you're standing in faith and believing that God's going to use you in that person's life, or if you're raising a difficult child right now or dealing with a messy situation at a job that maybe in the natural you'd like to run away from but you really believe that God wants you there because you're one of the few believers that work there, then God will give you the faith, the grace, and the confidence to be there. And I believe that, even, that we can even be in difficult places and still be happy and still enjoy our lives. I don't think that God just calls us to a life of misery. It concerns me when I hear people talking about how miserable they are, but they know they're where God wants them. <laughs> well, I just know that I'm where God wants me, and I just know this is where I'm supposed to be, but I am just so miserable, and it's just so hard. Well, you know what? I just think we need to give God a little more credit than that, don't you? I don't really think that's His style at all. And so I think that it's the way we approach things that make them hard. It's not the thing that's hard, it's the way we approach it that makes it hard. And if we approach it with confidence, which is really faith in God, then you'll be amazed at what all you can do. Confidence, however, is not just a faith that we have in our heart that just kind of sits there, but real confidence is faith activated. It is faith taking a step against fear. Fear is not going to go away. We're always going to have to confront fear from time to time in our lives. Every single one of us will have to confront fear from time to time in our lives. If you're waiting for the feeling of fear to go away, then you're going to be waiting all your life. And so if you don't learn anything else this weekend, you're going to learn to do it afraid. You're going to learn that, that courage is taking action when you feel afraid. Courage is not having no feelings of fear, but it's doing what you know you should do even when you feel afraid. Faith gets out of the boat and walks on water. Well, what is confidence? I could give you a bunch of fancy definitions, but I'm just going to give you mine. How's that? I believe faith is having a positive attitude about yourself and what you can do, and yet not worrying about what you cannot do. I like that. Faith is having a, a positive attitude about what you can do, and not worrying at all about what you can't do. Because really, if we're trusting God, why do we get all upset about the things we can't do? Because if He wanted me to do it, then He would enable me to do it. Amen? I'm really getting a hold of that thing that God gives us the faith to do what He wants us to do. And whatever God wants us to do, He gives us the faith for it, and therefore it's not a big struggle, it's not hard, it's not difficult, it's just what you do. This isn't hard for me, it's just what I do. Now, I used to make it hard 
because of the way I approached it. First of all, if you're trying to impress everybody, you're going to be miserable. If I would come out here wanting to impress you, being worried about how you were going to receive me and how you were going to like this and how you were going to like that, and concerned about this, concerned about that, and watching every look on everybody's face, and then I'd just be miserable. But I just decided to have a good time in Jesus, and I hope you do too. And I'm going to give it my best, and that's all I can do, and I hope it's good enough. But if it's not, you'll have to take it up with God, because I can't go beyond that. And I think if we all decide to live that way, life is going to get a whole lot sweeter. Take the pressure off yourself. I don't think there is any such thing as freedom, not real freedom, until we're free from the need to impress other people. Come on now, I just said something important. I said, I don't think that we're really free, not really free, until we're free from the need to impress other people. Don't get up in the morning and spend two hours getting dressed so you can go out and impress the world. Get dressed for Jesus. And I mean it. Lord, I want to look good for you today. I want to put on something I'm going to look good in for you. I want you to be proud of me when I go out today. When we begin to live for God, He will give us favor with people. Not worrying about what you can't do. Confident, confidence always looks forward. It never looks backwards. Confidence always has hope because it's positive. Confidence looks up and around, not down. A confident person doesn't concentrate or focus on their weaknesses, they maximize their strengths. And you know, I think we have a real tendency to work on our weaknesses. Now I'm going to work on this weakness. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to work on this weakness. Man, I got to work on this weakness. And in the process, we never develop our strengths. Do you know that many years ago, many years ago, when I first started teaching, had my first little home Bible study, I wanted to play guitar and sing and be a worship leader. <laughs> Did you know that, Darlene? I wanted to play guitar, sing, and be a worship leader. Well, why did I want to do that? Well, because other people were doing it and I couldn't do it. And so I wasn't happy doing what I did. I wanted to do everything. Yeah. I wanted to do it all. I wanted to be one of those all around people, you know, that could sing and play guitar and preach and run the whole thing. And then I wouldn't need anybody. <laughs> I could get all the glory. Well, I have short fingers. See how short my fingers are? They're just not very long. They're cute, but short. <laughs> and the problem is, is they don't fit very well around the neck of a guitar. So I tried to take some guitar lessons, and I mean, I was struggling. I wasn't happy with a guitar. I didn't like the guitar. It wasn't giving me joy to try to learn to play the guitar because, frankly, I almost failed music. I couldn't get that do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do thing. It didn't make me any difference. <laughs> do you know that I almost failed English in school? I got a D in English, and now I'm preaching all over the world. You see, I didn't care if it was a verb, a noun, or a proverb. I just wanted to talk. Just let me loose and I'll talk. <laughs> now, see, I could have just quit right then and said, well, how could anybody do public speaking if they failed English? Well, see, I'm not counting on my ability. I'm counting on God to work through my weaknesses. Why do we get... Why do we get all upset about our weaknesses when the Bible says plainly that His strength is made perfect in our weaknesses? Wow! You better hope you never get rid of all your weaknesses, because if you do, there won't be any room for God to work in your life. So we need to stop trying to fix everything that's wrong with us, and we need to focus on what we've got some ability at. The world is not looking for threes or fours or fives, and maybe if I would have struggled and struggled and struggled and struggled, who knows, maybe I could have learned to play the guitar enough to get by. I don't know about the singing part, but I don't know, you know, maybe if I had enough backup and enough loud music or something, I could get by with it, but we'd have to have filters and everything imaginable to, for me to pull it off. So maybe I could have become a four, I don't know. But you know what? The world doesn't want a, a, a worship leader that's a four. 
The world is not looking for threes and fours, they want tens. And if you'll take something that you're reasonably good at and focus on that and, and work with God on that, then you can become a nine or a 10 at something. And then you can be really good at something. So I'm challenging you to take a step out of your little boat. Because see, you may live in the boat of, what's wrong with me? This is wrong with me and that's wrong with me and this is wrong with me and I can't do this and I can't do that and I can't do this and I can't do that. And you're in the boat with all the other camps. And you all just sit there and talk about what you can't do and you shake and shake and shake and shake. And shake. <laughs> but somebody needs to say, well, you know, if I can't, then maybe God doesn't want me to. And so I'm just going to leave that with God. And if he ever wants me to, then he can make me able. And I'm going to find something I'm good at. And I'm just going to get out of my little boat. And I'm going to start doing that thing that I can do. You say, well, you know, the problem is, Joyce, I don't do anything fancy. Well, I'll go to Romans 12 for a minute. Oh, I tell you, I'm going to have so much fun this weekend, I can feel it in my bones. <laughs> Woo! I love this conference. And all the rest of them, too. I love it all. <laughs> Haven't preached for two weeks. I'm like a wild person up here. Whew. Now, you know, you're familiar with this, but I was reading these scriptures again this morning. They weren't even meant to be part of this message, but I thought, this is so good. We got to get this. Romans 12, verse 6. Having gifts, faculties, talents, qualities that differ, according to the grace given unto us, let us use them. Now, first thing you got to understand is even people who have similar gifts, one person may have a stronger gift than another person, even though their gifting is in the same area. And it's all according to the grace that God gives them to do what they're called to do. Let us use the gifts. According to the grace given us, let us use the gifts. Let us use the gifts. I wonder how many of you have gifts that you're not using because you disrespect your gift. You don't think your gift is anything important or anything worth paying attention to. Well, you know, I don't have much of a gift. I mean, I just... I don't know, I mean, I do kind of like to encourage people, but that's not much, you know, somebody might say. Well, you know what? The gift of encouragement is actually a gift given by the Holy Spirit. And it's probably one of the most needful gifts in the body of Christ. Man, I need those people around that encourage me because the world is full of people that want to tell you what's wrong with you. So you need the ones around that are going to encourage you and make you feel like a million bucks. Amen? That's not a nothing gift. If you're just an up person and an encourager, John Maxwell's like that. I mean, every time John comes around, he makes me feel like that I'm the most important person on the planet. Well, I would invite John just to get built up if for nothing else. <laughs> I have John come around all the time just because, hey, praise the Lord, he makes me feel good. And there's a gift in here of, of superintending. There are people that are just organized. Man, you can come and organize my stuff. I mean, you know. Praise God, I ain't got time to do it. <laughs> Your gift is needed in the body of Christ. It says, if your gift is prophecy, let him prophesy. And that doesn't mean going around telling everybody what they're supposed to do with their life. <laughs> hey, yay, I say unto you, go to Africa. <laughs> Please don't come tell me that. I had a prophecy two weeks ago. Yay, I say unto you, the Lord says you should give me your ministry and submit to me. I said, I don't think so. Prophecy means telling forth the inspired Word of God. Now, yes, there are prophets that may give you a more clear word about your life, but in this instance, he's talking about speaking forth, telling forth the Word of God. Let him do it in proportion to his faith. In other words, even if I'm a teacher of the Word, I shouldn't try to go beyond my faith. You know what I think gets people in trouble? Trying to do stuff they really don't have the faith to do. Well, the Bible says I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Well, that's right, it does say that, but really it means that you can do all things that God has called you to do through Christ who strengthens you. You can't just go do anything you want to do or everything somebody else is doing. You cannot go beyond the grace of God on your life. 
And just because somebody else can do something you can't do, that doesn't mean that you have a weakness. It just means that you need to learn to function in your gifting. Can anybody say amen? amen? He whose gift is practical service, let him give himself to serving. Verse 7, I love that. There's a gift of just serving. There's a lot of people who just like to do simple stuff for other people. I'll get the water. I'll clean up the dishes. Well, it ain't going to be me because that's not my gift. You know, now if you spill it, I'll order somebody to clean it up. <laughs> but I would need somebody around with the serving gifts because, I mean, you know, I'm just being honest. That's, I mean, it's not that I won't do it or think I'm too good to do it, but that would not be my natural bent. What can I say? You know, you got the, the, la the love language books where everybody's got a love language. There's a way that, you know, each person likes to be ministered to. And oh, I know what mine is. Acts of service, number one. Number two, gifts. I love that one too. Yeah, I, I like the nice words. And, but man, I just love it when people do stuff for me. I don't know, maybe that's because I'm so busy and got so much on my plate. I just like it when those servers come around and help make my life easier. God has got everything covered. Dave and I, this may sound strange, but we talk about this all the time when we're driving around. Just look at that, Dave will say, there's a guy up on that scaffold and he washes windows all day long. God has given him the ability to do that. God has got everything covered. He has put a desire in somebody to do everything that needs to be done. And if everybody just does their part, the whole job gets done, and we don't have to be jealous and critical. We can just love each other and all work together. I believe that we are in a time like never before when we need to partner with other people to get things done. The way that you get the most benefit, the greatest power, is by joining gifts together. By joining anointings together. One can put a thousand to flight, two ten thousand, and so on and so forth. But because of the insecurities in people, many times it's difficult to find people that you can really work with closely. Because we, we hurt my feelings. And I expected this and you didn't that. And you know what? We just all need to grow up. And just forget about ourselves and start working together and getting God's job done. Amen? Well, you know, the devil's tried to keep women down long enough, and I believe it's time for women to rise up and take their rightful place. And I mean that sincerely. Let me tell you some facts about women in history. First of all, God never intended women to be less than men. They've had a rough time ever since the garden. It just basically never has stopped and women have gotten a bad rap ever since Eve ate the apple, gave it to Adam and he ate it. However, the Bible says clearly that sin came into the world through one man. The Bible, two different scriptures. I could take you, I don't have time. That sin came into the world through one man. It say, does not say it came in through a woman, it came in through a man. Now why is that? Because God gave man the responsibility to guard and tend the garden. He gave man, the woman, to be his helpmate. She was taken out of his side, not from under his feet. She was not to be walked on, was she was to walk alongside of him as a helpmate. The Bible actually says that, he that she completed him. Amen. Now, I just want to throw something out here just to say that I understand where a lot of you women are at. I doubt that any of the men that are here need this, so I'm not trying to preach to the guys, I'm not trying to be cutesy up here or have an attitude, but I believe this with all my heart. I think a lot of men, I think a lot of the reason today 
why we have problems in relationships and even one of the reasons why women sometimes have a tendency to not want to submit to their husband's authority is because a lot of men apparently have the same problem that Adam had. They want authority, but they don't take responsibility. And I believe this is one of the tragedies of our society. Men want to go to work, if they work, and come home and sit in the chair all night and have somebody get them this and get them that and get them something else. And the woman probably works too and then she comes home and has to go to the little league and the soccer game and the this and the that and drive the kids that are wearing and get up at daylight and make the lunches and come home and do the laundry and go to the grocery store and you know, all this stuff. And a lot of times, you know, women have the responsibility for the household finances and they're the ones that have to be concerned about everything. And like I said, I am not trying to be smart or cute. I think that, that you all understand exactly where I'm coming from. And I'll tell you, it is not right for somebody to have authority if they don't want the responsibility. I believe that one of the greatest tragedies in our society is men are not taking their responsibility. And that's evidenced by the number of men who walk off from their families and then won't even bother to support their kids. It's not right. And it's demonic, it's the work of the devil, and that's an area that we need to pray in. It's not gonna do any good to gripe about it, but ladies, we need to start a prayer revival and begin to pray for men worldwide to stand up and take their responsibility and be the men that they're supposed to be. We want strong men. I've got a strong man. I've got a husband who's easygoing, and to be honest with you, Dave lets me have my way in a lot of stuff, but when he puts his foot down, his foot is down. And let me tell you something. I may be in charge up here, but when I get off this platform, I'm Dave Meyer's wife, and I know that. And we have a good relationship, but the fact that we're not fighting and arguing and I'm not rebellious behind the scenes is one of the reasons why this is working. One of the reasons why God cannot use as many women as he wants to is because women don't know sometimes how to be in authority when they're in their, their thing, their gifting that God's called them to do, and then be a real woman behind the scenes. And to be a real woman, we don't have to be militant, we don't have to be rebellious, we don't have to have a bad attitude, we don't have to say, I don't need men, I hate men, I'm not going to do what any man tells me to do. God has placed lines of authority in the earth, and we, we both have a responsibility. Men need to treat women right, and women need to know how to submit properly to godly authority, because there's ease and safety in that. Well, I'm preaching better than you're acting. <laughs> to submit to somebody, you have to respect them. Amen? Now, I know a lot of you probably got a lot of problems in this area at home. I know that probably a lot of you feel like that you have all the responsibility on your shoulders and, and you wish that somebody would take some of that responsibility. And what I'm saying to you, I'm not saying to you, so you go home and say, Joyce Meyer said. <laughs> you need to read this book on the confidence. Well, some of you will buy him a copy and cross out W-O and give it to him, won't you? <laughs> but what you need to do is start praying. I'm telling you what, I have been so amazed in the last year of my life more than ever before about the prayers that God will answer if we will just pray instead of taking things into our own hands. I mean, if you will just begin to pray, just begin to pray, you will be amazed about what God will do. Some of the problems you have, you can't solve them. The more you try to solve them, the worse you're going to make the mess. You need to pray and let God work. Let God be God. Amen? Amen. How many of you men that are here agree with me that men have no business with authority if they won't take responsibility? All right. Let's hear it, men. All right. Did you hear those few bold, amen? <laughs> All right. Well, Adam should have said no to Eve, but he didn't. Women are emotional. She probably thought the apple was pretty and got excited and <laughs> he's supposed to be the one with the logic. He should have came in and said, not a cool thing to do, Eve. But he didn't. He got talked into it too. Well, the devil has hated women ever since the garden because 
it was made clear to him in the garden that a woman would give birth to the Savior that would defeat him. You can find it in Genesis 3.15. The devil hates women. And that's very evident if you study history, which I did a lot of study to write this book. It is absolutely pathetic, the attitudes that have been fostered toward women since the beginning of time. Here's a few facts. Plato said there was no hell, that a man's true punishment was to endure women. It was said in Greek mythology that Zeus created women from one of ten sources. A long-haired sow, an evil fox, a dog, the dust, the sea, an obstinate donkey, a weasel, the mare, the monkey, or the bee. <laughs> women have been abused, maligned, hated, disrespected throughout much of history. 600 to 800,000 women and children are captured yearly and used in sex trafficking industry. Not men, women. Approximately 120 million women worldwide experience female circumcision so they can never enjoy sex. It's horribly painful, practiced mainly in Africa and the Middle East. This is done to women. Women are victims of rape, sexual assault, incest, spousal beatings. Occasionally you hear of a woman who beats up her husband, but that doesn't happen too often. <laughs> women, to be honest, have been a minority just like many of the other minorities. Prior to the women's rights movements, which began in 1848 when five women got together for tea and decided to do something about their situation, women could not vote, they could not own property, they were basically owned by men who could beat or imprison them with no punishment at all. Most occupations were closed to women. They were not accepted into colleges or universities, the only reason being, you're a woman. When God called me to preach, I was already teaching my little home Bible study. People were coming, the anointing was there, people were getting blessed and helped, and then somebody said, you can't do that, you're a woman. Oh, I guess God didn't know that. <laughs> so I told God, I can't do this, I'm a woman. <laughs> you don't think I knew that? <laughs> Nobody can ever tell me that women can't preach because when Jesus <laughs> I mean, how foolish, you know? Why I we were talking coming here tonight and I said, "Why if women were never supposed to be leaders or have any kind of a oomph for authority?" in their personality, why would God give us those kinds of personalities? Just to aggravate us and torment us and put us in a position where we'd have to argue with somebody all of our life? No. It's the devil that's done this, and it's being undone, but we have to make sure that we go about it the right way. And as I said before, being militant and having a bad attitude and getting all goofy with it is not the answer. God is moving among women and a lot of wonderful things are happening and are going to continue to happen in the future. We don't have to get goofy and try to say God's a woman like some women of the radical feminist movement have done. You know, they, I got asked that on a very popular talk show, you know, well, do you believe, what, what sex is God? <laughs> I said, well, you know what, the Bible calls him he and that's fine with me. You know, I don't think we got to get into gender. God just is God. Amen. He's a father. Some of the silly questions. Let's talk about, you know, let's take this TV time to talk about something that's going to help somebody, not something that's going to scramble their brains that are already messed up. <laughs> Women don't need to act like men. I don't need to act like men. I, I, I got a great compliment from a very well-known preacher in this last year. He said, you know what I like about you? He said, I love to listen to you preach because you preach like a woman. You don't get in the pulpit and pre act like you think you're a man. You just get up there and you're the woman that you are. And ladies, I'm telling you, you don't have to be anything other than you are woman, and that's good enough. All right, now, I want to talk to you about seven secrets of a confident woman. By the grace of God, we're going to get through the seven. Number one, 
A confident woman knows that she is loved. Would you bring my little trees out here? I'd like you to go to Ephesians 3.17. Oh, we need to know that we're loved. Everybody wants to be loved. Everybody wants to be loved for who they are. They don't want to be loved for what they do. They want to be loved for who they are. Everybody wants unconditional love. They want to be accepted. Everybody wants friends that really knows them, knows a few of their weaknesses and faults, but loves them anyway. Isn't that right? Well, you know, in the world we don't always get that, do we? I can't guarantee you that you'll get that all the time in the world. Matter of fact, I can probably guarantee you that there's going to be plenty of times when you won't. But the good news is, is we don't have to go to the world to get what we need. That's the problem. I spent the first 40 years of my life trying to go to the world to get what I needed. And found out now that I can get everything I need from God. Amen? He loves me. He loves you. And you know, that's so important. That's not just a little Sunday school lesson. Oh yeah, praise the Lord, I know God loves me. I believe that the love of God is the healing balm for everything that ails us. When, and I'm not talking about a little teaching. I'm not talking about head knowledge. I'm talking about knowing when you know that you know that you know that you know that God loves you. And no matter what you ever do, He's never going to stop loving you. God gets angry at sin and He deals with our sin, but He loves us and He's committed to us. And He says, I love you with an everlasting love. An everlasting love, an unconditional love. In Ephesians 3.17, Paul said, May Christ, through your faith, actually dwell, settle down, abide, make his permanent home in your hearts. Now notice, Paul said, this has got to happen through your faith. It's not about how you feel. It's got to happen through your faith. And faith is about what you cannot see, and faith is about what you cannot feel. Faith is about what you know way down deep inside. Faith operates in the realm of the unseen. If I can see it and feel it, I don't need faith for it. So through your faith, may you be rooted deep in love and founded, there's our word, securely on love. If I know that God loves me, then I can be confident to try new things. I can be confident to step out of my boring boat that I've been living in. I can be confident to have opinions and ideas. I can be confident enough to not always have to be like everybody else. I can have confidence if I know that I know that I know God loves me. And as I said, I can be confident to step out and try new things because you see, I really know that it doesn't matter all that much if I try something and I happen to be wrong. Being wrong is not the end of the world. If you don't learn anything else from a mistake, you learn not to do that again. Amen. Our past can be the greatest educator that we have. The Bible talks about roots, that we're to be rooted in Christ. And we're to be rooted in His love. Now I know you're all smart enough to know what that means, but we went to the trouble to just do a little something to show you. In Romans 8 it says that we should never let anything take the love of God away from us. Never. Let anything take the love of God away from you. No, no tragedy, no problem, no disappointment. No matter what happens in your life, you should never, ever, ever, ever say to God, well don't you love me? Because your trouble has nothing to do with God not loving you. <laughs> so if you're rooted in God, <clears throat> no matter how many storms come, no matter how much shaking, you're in. Ah. Because you got roots, man. These roots, if you can see this, there's roots. Oh, I mean, they're just, they're dug in, those roots, man. Well, see, that's the way God wants us to be on the inside. He wants us to be, that love just, we're, we're dug into that. I know that God loves me. I hope you love me, but if you don't, that's between you and God. But I know that God loves me. You say, well, my parents didn't love me. 
Well, you know what? A lot of people have that situation, including me. And you can take the attitude, well, I'll never be okay. That just leaves a hole in your life that you can never get over. Or you can read the Bible in Psalm 27:10, where it says, even though my mother and my father have forsaken me, yet the Lord will take me up and adopt me as his child. You can say, well, you know, God doesn't love me. He's forgotten about me. God has not forgotten about you. In Isaiah 49, it says, can a nursing mother forget about her child? Well, no. God says, neither have I forgotten you. I have imprinted or tattooed on the palms of each one of my hands a picture of you. God has not forgotten about you. And I love the example of the nursing mother. Now, you'll just have to bear with us for a minute here, men. I know you won't get this because you've never nursed a baby, but any woman who has will get this. When you're nursing a child, that child can be off in another room and whimper, just whimper, and you will fill up with provision for that child. <laughs> and, and, have you ever had a time where you, try, you were trying to feed your baby and they had gotten so upset that they wouldn't take it? <laughs> and here you've got provision, you're like, eat, eat, eat. <laughs> and you know, one of the reasons why you want them to eat, because at this point, you've got so much provision that it's hurting you. And I love that example in the Bible. I absolutely love that. God says, I've not forgotten you. Can a nursing mother forget the child of her womb? And I believe that's the analogy that he was trying to bring. It's impossible for a nursing mother to forget the child of her womb. And every time that child cries, that mother fills up instantly with provision. And every time you whimper, God hears it and he's got your provision. And you have not been forgotten. And don't let the devil tell you that you've been forgotten. You may be waiting longer than somebody else. You may not understand, but God is a God of justice and everything he does is fair and everything he does is right. I'm so glad that I know God loves me. Woo. Blow, wind, blow. Devil, take your best shot. But now you know what? If you're not rooted, here comes a storm. Woo. Oh, let's see if we can patch it up and fix it. This is the way we go to church. This is the way we go. I'm a happy little Christian on Sunday morning. But Monday we get a storm. Whoop. Look at that. No roots. Be rooted and grounded in the love of God. You can take away the mess now, guys. Thank you. Now, remember he said, through your faith in Christ, be rooted in the love of God. So step one that I want you to take tonight, and like I said, this is not just a little Sunday school lesson. This is probably the most needed message that we could preach. Because God's not going to love you anymore when you lose the weight you want to lose. He's not going to love you anymore when you get over your bad temper. He's not going to love you anymore when you become perfectly patient. Yeah, those things may need to change, but God's love is what's going to change them in you. God's not going to love you when you change. He loves you now, and that's what makes you want to change. Hallelujah. So through your faith in Christ, be rooted in the love of God. So here's what I'm asking you to do. No matter how you felt about yourself in the past, I want you to stop looking at your circumstances and deciding that God does or doesn't love you based on your circumstances. Well, I have a friend who just got married last year and her husband's already accepted Christ and I've been married to this guy for 20 years and I've been believing my guts out and he's still a loser. <laughs> so I don't know, you know, what am I doing wrong? Maybe God doesn't love me. I need to stop all that stuff. And here's what I want you to do. I want you to take one big giant step of faith out of your boat of insecurity and I want you to say, God loves me. And the devil's never going to take that away from me again. 
and I want you to say it about a hundred times every day out loud, God loves me. Go look at yourself in the mirror and say, God loves me. And if there's somebody you know that you can tell and they won't think you're just all full of yourself and get a wrong idea, then you can say, God loves me. God loves me, not the milkman or the postman. God loves me. <laughs> Secret number two, the confident woman refuses to live in fear. Well, I can't help it, I'm just timid. I can't help it, I'm just, I just got one of those fearful personalities. That's a bunch of hogwash. Maybe you haven't confronted fear. You think I don't have to confront fear? You think just because I got a big mouth that I never have any fear? I mean, I don't have time to tell all the stories that I could tell you, but you know, I was on Good Morning America last week. Anybody get to see that on Good Morning America? Well, you know, that was the second time I'd been on the show. And I, we were talking about the confident woman, and the first time I was on it was about my book, Approval Addiction. And, and Robin, who interviewed me, we were talking about fear, and I said, I said, yeah, this was much easier today than it was the first time. I wasn't really afraid at all today. She said, you mean you were afraid the first time? I said, yeah, I felt nervous. I felt, you know, anytime you do something that you've never done before, that you have no experience with, you're going to feel that. The, the, the difference in the people that are doing things and the people that are not is not that they don't both have fear. It's one of them is willing to, to move against it, trusting God, and the other just waits for those feelings to go away. Oh, I just didn't feel afraid. I just didn't feel afraid. I'll tell you the first time that I had an opportunity to, to speak publicly, I was invited to do a workshop at a conference in Jacksonville, Florida. And I, they just asked me because the speaker canceled. And I mean, that's the truth. You know, somebody knew somebody that knew somebody that knew somebody and they were desperate. So they said, well, call her and see if she can come. Well, man, I showed up with all my tapes. I mean, this whole big table of tapes because I felt like God told me I was going to have a teaching tape ministry. And people look at the tapes, who's her? Anybody ever heard of her? Never heard of her. You ever heard of her? And I'm going. <laughs> and on the front row, there was Dr. So-and-so and Reverend So-and-so and Dr. So-and-so and Reverend So-and-so and Joyce. Because <laughs> I didn't have no doctors or reverends in front of my name. And they asked me to get up and say what my workshop was going to be on the next day. You see, I wasn't doing a main session like I get to do tonight. I was doing a little workshop in the afternoon. I had a little room that held just a few hundred people. And I was one of the kind of sideline things, you know, that was going on. So they wanted us to get up and tell what our workshop was going to be about. And I am telling you the honest to God's truth. I was so stinking scared. I got up and walked to the platform and I opened my mouth and I was so scared that when I tried to speak, nothing came out. I went. Mm -mm. And I tell you, the devil's screaming at me, you go back to Fenton where you belong. You are out of your league. Who do you think you are? Look at Dr. So-and-so and Reverend So-and-so and Dr. So-and-so and Reverend So-and-so. And you heard those people talking out in the lobby. Nobody even knows who you are. Well, you know what? God knew who I was. And God knew where I'd been. And he'd seen all those years of study and preparation and trying to be obedient to him and and every sacrifice that he asked me to make, and God had a plan for me. Man didn't know me, but God knew me. And God knows you. And when your time for promotion comes, there's no devil in hell that can stop you, and no person on earth that can stop God. Amen? Because what God lifts up, man cannot put down. Hallelujah. I had two choices, open my mouth and try again and make a real fool out of myself or leave the platform, pack my tapes, come back to Fenton, get in my boat, my Fenton boat, and stay there the rest of my life. Obviously, I opened my mouth again. The devil convinced me nobody would come to my seminar. However, the next day, there were so many people in the room, they couldn't all get in. They were hanging out the doors. They ran out to the tape tables, bought everything but the tablecloths, about killed Dave, <laughs> trying to get the product. He still says he's never seen anything like it. And so that was kind of our public beginning. Don't let fear rule your life. Hebrews 10, 38. But the just shall live by faith. 
My righteous servant shall live by his conviction respecting man's relationship to God and divine things and holy fervor born of faith and conjoined with it. And if he draws back and shrinks in fear, my soul has no delight or pleasure in him. That does not mean that God doesn't love you, but it means that it saddens him at what you miss because you shrink back instead of pressing forward. Now we're going to talk about fear a lot more in other teachings that I'm going to do, but how many of you know right now that fear has stopped you at different times in your life from doing what you really know that you should have been doing? Fear of what people think, fear of what they're going to say, fear of failure, fear of, of being laughed at, fear, fear, fear. Secret number three, a confident woman has a positive attitude. Now some of you are praying for confidence, but you are negative. Confidence and negativity are like oil and water, they just don't mix. Now being positive is a choice, it's not a feeling. Nobody can rule your attitude but you. Your circumstances can't rule your attitude. Some other negative person can't rule your attitude. And I know what it's like to be negative because I used to be very negative. I jokingly say if I thought two positive thoughts in a row, my brain got in a cramp. <laughs> but that was just about the truth. I mean, I was just super, super negative. And one of the first things that God started trying to teach me was that I had to stop being so negative. You cannot have what God wants you to have if you don't get into agreement with God and God is not negative. There's nothing about God that is negative. Now some of you may think that you're protecting yourself by being negative. You think, well, I've never had any good thing, anything good happen to me and so if I don't expect anything good then I won't be disappointed when it doesn't happen. But what you're doing is you're closing the door and not allowing God to do any of the good things that He wants to do in your life. You have to be very positive. Choose your attitude. Thinking negatively makes you miserable. Now here's a statement. But you have the power to be happy. Did you hear me? You have the power to be happy. You say, I just don't feel very happy. I just woke up down and didn't feel very happy. Well, you know what? You have the power to be happy. You can choose to be thankful, that'll make you happy. You can choose to go do something for somebody else, that will make you happy. You can choose to think about something good, that will make you happy. If you think you got it bad, go find somebody that's got it worse than you. Because there's people everywhere. A negative attitude makes you mean, not confident. How many of you have a lean toward being negative? Let's see how many honest people we have. Come on, put your hand up. If you lean toward being negative. Okay, now, everybody look at me. You can stop that if you want to. You can do something about it. We can preach and preach and preach and preach. God could send you one preacher after another, one teacher after another. You can buy everybody's tapes and everybody's books, but nobody's attitude changes until that person decides to change it. And yes, it'll be a struggle for a little bit because you formed a bad habit, but you can make a new habit. Put up signs all over your house, fight the devil. Put up signs that says, be positive. Get two or three friends that you trust, that you believe love you, and tell them, every time you hear me being negative, I want you to confront me. You need to draw a line in the sand tonight, and you need to say, now hear this devil, I am not going to live in negativity anymore. I will not stay negative. I am not going to be a, a sour puss in life. My, my glass is not always going to be half empty. It's going to be half full. And I'm going to put a positive connotation on everything so I can open the door for God to work in my life. Amen? That's why I decided that it doesn't even make any sense to look back and say, well, if I could do my life over, I'd do this over and that over and this over and that over. I ain't even going there. I can't go back and do it over. So I've just decided God can do something good with all of it. Amen? Whew, I'm having fun. Number four, a confident woman recovers from setbacks. 
She refuses to live in self-pity. You can be pitiful or you can be powerful, but you can't be both. Setbacks are not failures. They are educators for our future. God always provides a place of new beginnings. Every day I can simply decide, today I begin again. Today I begin again. This is a new day. Letting go of what lies behind, it's under the blood of Jesus. Today I begin again. I dare you to live like that. That's what I'm thinking about calling my book that's coming out next fall. I'm thinking about calling it, I Dare You. How many of you like that title? I dare you to live with purpose and passion. There's something in us. Well, if you dare me, I may just do it. So I'm daring you to be positive. I mean, just be so positive that you drive the negative people around you crazy. It's so funny, you know, we, we think, well, you know, I just wish I was one of these successful people. Well, you know the old saying, well, if at first you don't succeed, try, try again. A confident woman will refuse to be defeated. If you have a dream or a vision in your heart, then you better make your mind up right now. You may have to go around the mountain a few times, and everything may not work out exactly the way you want it to the first time, but if it's really in your heart and you really believe it's from God, then you better let the devil know, I am not quitting and I am not giving up. I am going to have victory in my life. I made my mind up, I will be what God wants me to be, I will do all that He's called me to do, and I will have everything He wants me to have. And if you don't make your mind up to it, nobody else can do it for you. Just listen to a few of these things, I think this is interesting. It's said that there's not a moment of the day when reruns of the I Love Lucy show are not playing somewhere in the world. Lucille Ball's career, however, didn't start off so well. She was once dismissed from drama school for being too shy and too quiet. In 1962, the Decca Recording Company turned down the opportunity to work with the Beatles. Their rationale, we don't like their sound. Groups of guitars are on their way out. Clint Eastwood was once told by a Universal Pictures executive that his future was not promising. The man said, you have a chip in your tooth, your Adam's apple sticks out too far, and you talk too slow. <laughs> you know what? You better stop listening to what everybody else says. And you better get in touch with what's in your heart. What has God put in your heart? Don't be afraid to follow your heart, women. I think sometimes we get we feel safer with rules and regulations that somebody else makes for us to follow than we do following our heart. And you know why I think that is? Because if you tell me to do something and it's wrong, then it's your fault. And I don't have to think I made a mistake. But if I step out and I say, well, I'm going to do what's in my heart, and I turn out to be wrong, now I've got to deal with it. I dare you to start following your heart. And I'm talking about your real, your, your spirit. I'm not just talking about your emotions. You don't have to be like everybody else. You don't have to do what everybody else does. God's looking for people that will do something new and innovative. Stop looking around at everybody else to see how you ought to be. Follow your heart. Step out of your boring boat. Henry Ford went broke five times before he succeeded. These companies went bankrupt. Quaker Oats three times, Pepsi-Cola three times, Bird's Eye Frozen Foods, Borden's Aunt Jemima, and Wrigley's Gum three times. Amazing. Past performance is usually a pretty good indication of man's future potential, but not always. In 1860, a 38-year-old man was working as a handyman for his father, a leather merchant. He kept books, drove wagons, and handled hides for $66 a month. Prior to this menial job, the man had failed as a soldier, a farmer, and a real estate agent. Most everybody he knew had written him off as a failure. Eight years later, he became the President of the United States. His name was Ulysses S. Grant. 
There are some unbelievable stories about the successes that people have who just simply, the only thing that they have going for them is they refuse to give up. <laughs> Did you hear me? Can I tell you something? I mean, I, and I'm telling you the truth. This is, this is not a personal put down, I'm just telling you the truth. I don't do that much. I mean, I honestly don't think that I'm especially talented. I mean, I talk and I do that good. I mean, I am a good communicator. God has given me a real gift to communicate. But I mean, that's it. That's what I do. That's what I do. But I will tell you what I have going for me. One thing that I have, I mean, when I get a hold of something, I am like a bulldog. And I will not quit and I will not give up. And it is amazing what God can do with somebody who refuses to quit and refuses to give up. I didn't quit when all my friends turned against me. I didn't quit when family turned against me. I didn't quit when I had nobody but me and Dave doing everything. I didn't quit when there was no money. I didn't quit when I got sick. You just can't quit. You just can't quit. I had a lot of different issues with my health over the years, things that people wouldn't even know about. Not stuff that was necessarily going to kill you, but just stuff that made it hard for me to do what I was doing. I had breast cancer 13 years ago. I had to have a, a hysterectomy. My hormones went crazy. I couldn't take any kind of hormones because of having had the cancer. And I mean, ugh. And I was working so hard, I just thought I was going to die. And, I remember sitting out on my patio one morning. I think sometimes these are defining moments in our lives when the devil's pressing you so hard to get you to give up. And I remember sitting out on my patio one morning. I said, you know what, God? I don't know how much strength I've got left, but whatever I've got, you're getting it. And I'm going to take every drop, every ounce of strength that I've got, and I'm going to serve you with it till the day that I die. And I tell you, if you just won't quit, Get over that wimpy, whiny, I can't, it's too hard, I'm not up to it attitude. You need to say, I'm a woman of God, I am full of confidence, and I can do whatever I need to do through Christ who strengthens me. God is on my side. Can anybody feel a little fire in their belly? Number five, a confident woman avoids comparisons. Very simply, the Bible says, thou shalt not covet. If you'll start applying that everywhere, it'll be a new life for you. Do not want to look like somebody else looks. Don't want their house, don't want their car, don't want their gifts. I used to say, oh, I wish I could sing like that. I would never say that now because I believe that it's actually wrong for me to want anything that anybody else has. God told me one time, you're sitting there wishing you could do what they can do, and I put that gift in them for your enjoyment. And here you are just jealous of it rather than enjoying it. Boy, you got some freedom when you just like being who you are. You just like doing what you can do. You know why my husband's happy? You know, Dave gets asked the question all the time, well, how is this for you with Joyce being up there? And being in them, yeah, 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 yeah. And Dave just says, you know what? I know what I'm gifted for. I know what my grace is. I know what my calling is. And God told me a long time ago that if I would stay in the area where his grace covers me, then I'll always be happy. But the minute I get out beside of it and start trying to do something that he didn't call me to do or to be something I'm not just to impress a bunch of people or to try to keep up with somebody else, I'm going to lose my joy. And I'm telling you folks, this is one of the reasons why people are not happy because they're busy trying to be something they're not, have something that God's not given them, and all you get is misery. Stop wanting what somebody else has. Well, I wish I would have gotten that promotion. You know what? If you were supposed to get it, God would have given it to you. Well, no, it's just my stupid boss. Well, you know what? If you have a good attitude toward even your stupid boss, when the time comes, God will get you a promotion. It's true. It's absolutely true. Thou shalt not covet. 
Don't be wanting what other people have. I remember the year that I took off trying to be a regular woman. Because I knew I wasn't normal. And everybody had me convinced I needed to just be normal. So I tried to be normal. Didn't work for me. I'm not anointed to be normal. I tried to have a garden because my neighbor had a garden. She grew tomatoes, so I grew tomatoes. She made her family's clothes, so I got a sewing machine, went to stretch and sew, got some material and tried to make clothes. Hated the sewing machine, hated the tomatoes. Totally lost my joy, wanted to preach and cast out devils, but I was trying to be regular. The tomatoes came in real pretty, the bugs came in and ate all mine overnight. They had big black holes in them and hers were still pretty. I got so mad, I said, God, she lives right next door to me. I could throw a rock and hit her garden. Why did the bugs eat my tomatoes and they left hers alone? He said, I never told you to grow tomatoes. I have no obligation to protect your tomatoes. Come on now. Some of you are trying to do something that God's not protecting. God's not making it happen because it's not what you're supposed to be doing. And you're trying to do it because somebody's got you convinced you should, you ought, you should, you ought. Get out of the boat and follow your heart. What do you want to do? You know what? Some of you don't even know what you want to do. You've spent so much of your life trying to make other people happy. If I got you in a corner and said, what do you want to do? You'd go, oh, oh, I don't know. You need to have your own dream, your own vision. God's got something for you, but you got to get in agreement with God. And you know what? If you start being the person God wants you to be, I can guarantee you you're going to make some people mad. Now you just might as well figure on it. You're going to lose some friends. You're going to make some people mad because the devil will sometimes use the people that you want their approval the most to keep you from going forward. But you just invest them and God will give you a hundred more better than they ever would have been if you follow God. Amen? All right, stick with me, almost done. Number six, a confident woman takes action. She takes initiative. She's aggressive, not passive. She doesn't talk about the problem. She does something about the problem. She's not a problem. She fixes problems. A confident woman never just complains about a situation. She searches for a solution. She doesn't wait for somebody else to do something about the problem. She does something about the problem. And last but not least, a confident woman does not live in if only and what if. Well, if only I wouldn't have been abused. If only I had more education. If only I had more money. If only I had more friends. If only I felt better and had more energy. <laughs> Yes, if only I had someone to help me. <laughs> oh God, if only I have someone to help me. And God says, excuse me, well I do. <laughs> I believe I've read this little thing in the Bible that says God is on our side. I'll never leave you nor forsake you. I'm in you, with you, around you, over you, under you, through you, to you, for you. <laughs> Amen. You'd be amazed what you and God can do if you'll just take those steps of faith. Now, I'm not suggesting you jump out and start doing a bunch of stupid stuff. You need to make sure that what you feel in your heart is God. We'll get around to a little bit more of that tomorrow night, but it's time for you to rise up and be the person that God wants you to be. God's got an exciting life for you. Chris, I want you to come on up and do the altar call for us. Nobody leaving yet? This is conference weekend. We don't have to follow a schedule. You're just going to go to your hotel room, stay up all night anyway, so. <laughs> now, I'm serious.